you could always create jobs domestically. You don't need to be a net exporter in order to create jobs. We have a very dysfunctional international financial system, which creates all these financial crises where the debtors are responsible for making the adjustments. And therefore, they have to try and protect themselves by trying to be a net exporter and trying to accumulate foreign exchange reserves. So right now, there are a lot of debates about de-dollarization, how Chinese yuan may in some ways replace the dollar's hegemonic status. But I think the real question is, do we simply want to replace one currency? with the other? Or do we want to reform the system so that we don't have the perceived need to accumulate reserves as a deficit or debt a country? Because now all this burden of adjustment is imposed on the deficit countries. The international financial system is failing them. <laughs> Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. If this is your first time hearing about MMT, you might want to listen to our first three episodes for an introduction, which I've linked to in the show notes, along with some other things that relate to this particular episode. And as ever, I've linked to where you can support this podcast financially via patreon.com slash MMT podcast. Support starts at a dollar a month or a pound a month or whatever the equivalent is wherever you live. We're 100% listener funded. Your financial support really helps keep the show going and your support in other ways, whether it's by recommending us to other people or just by listening and spreading the word about this stuff really helps too. A big thank you to all of our supporters so far and thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive in. Welcome one and all to the MMT podcast. I'm Christian Riley, And I'm Patricia Pino. And we are delighted to be joined today by the Kremer Endowed Chair of Economics at Willamette University, Professor Yan Liang. Thanks so much for joining us today, Yan. Thank you for having me. I have been a big fan of your podcast, so it's great to be on this time and share my thoughts. So thank you for providing that opportunity. Oh, well, we're so excited to talk to you about international trade and the economy of China. But because it's our first time talking, can you tell us how you first came to MMT? Because some people we ask this question to, they've had to learn neoclassical economics first, and then they had a lot of rethinking to do when they got confronted by MMT, and it was quite jarring. But was it like that for you? Actually, it was quite a well-planned process. I mean, my journey really started when I was an undergraduate in Zhongshan University in China, and then we had a Fulbright scholar of Charles Whelan. If you don't know, he is an economic historian, a labor economist, who was with Cornell at that time. So he came as a Fulbright scholar, and he taught this sort of a history of U.S. economy from Minsky's perspective, right, from Minsky's approach. I just fell in love with that analysis. And so I indicated to him that I wanted to come to stay and I want to learn more. I want to learn more about Minsky. I want to learn more about money. I was in the public finance and taxation major at that time in China. So he introduced me to Randall Ray. So that's how I ended up at UMKC almost two years later after I graduated because there was a little sort of detour to figure out exactly what I wanted to do. And so finally, I ended up at UMKC. I worked with Fred Lee. I worked with Randall Ray. I worked with CFAPS. I think Warren at the time was still financing the UMKC program. So I produced some of the balance report about China's macro economy for him. So that is just a natural, I think, process where I simply just start with the more heterodox programs, studying Minsky, studying with post-Keynesian institutionalism. I shouldn't forget to mention some of the great institutionalists, James Durgens and all these at UMKC. So that's how the sort of journey started and how it proceeded. And so, yeah, I think from the very beginning, I was more of a mmt <laughs> than switching from other sort of approaches. Great. So no reprogramming necessary, basically. Right. That's right. So that's how it started and how it's going is one of the courses you teach at Willamette is international economics and MMT proponents are often running into critics with concerns about exchange rates and the balance of international trade. For someone relatively new to the topic, what might be a good jumping off point for thinking about international trade through an MMT lens? 
Right. So I think the MMT's contributions to really analyze international trade, I think for one is really to understand that monetary nature of production and any sort of economic activities. Because right now, I think a lot of this sort of mainstream theories about international trade is always started with competitive advantage. It's all about goods and real production and how different countries have different sort of relative efficiency, and that's how drives trade. And what it leaves out is a lot of sort of at the macro level, how your domestic investment savings, domestic imbalances could lead to external imbalances. And the domestic dynamics has a lot to do with your monetary incentives, your monetary arrangements of production. So I think that's number one. And the number two is really to think about the impacts of trade, right? So the mainstream would always tell you exports are good for the country and imports are bad. But I think from an MMT's perspective, exports are a cost, are a real cost. It could be bad, it could be good, right? That really depends on what your country's priority needs and what your country's circumstances need. But I think that is a factual statement. It's a normative statement to say that exports are the cost because it reduces the real resources that the country's citizens and residents can enjoy. So I think those are just very, in a very minimal way, right? This at the threshold level, how the MMT approach would look at trade differently. Now, of course, there are a lot more extensions from there. For example, you know, how trade may or may not be balanced, right? Because mainstream would always tell you trade over the long term, right? The market is going to make sure that we will have a trade balance because if you export too much, your currency is going to appreciate and that will reduce your exports. And so you would eventually return to that balanced trade. But again, the MMT approach would say that's not necessarily the case because there are a lot of other factors, much more significant factors that affect exchange rates, not just your trade balance. So you could have persistent and large trade imbalances and that have different implications. And also, one last point I would say is this idea of compared advantage and the benefits of trade are always predicated on this assumption that we have full employment, right? And right there, I think MMT departs very radically, right? That we don't have full employment. This is something we want to work on. And this is something that MMT would propose and have the right tools to ensure that. But we don't have full employment to start with when you think about the benefits of trade. I guess in the developing world, the subject of trade is much more sensitive than in the developed world. And I think part of the reason why they view this focus on exports as a positive rather than imports is has to do a lot with this idea of reducing dependency as well as the, uh, helping reducing imports being a means of developing your own industries. And I, I guess that's born a little bit out of institutionalism, I guess. I was wondering... What were the similarities between institutionalism and MMT? And at what point did they depart, do you think? I think what institutionalism and MMT have very similar concept, right? And understanding of what money is. Money is not just a creature that is to facilitate exchanges. Institutionalism has really rich historical and political and cultural and all these understanding of what money is, right? So from Pollyanni's work, and from Dotley's work, we all see how money is institution. It's not a sort of free market product and so on and so forth. But I think what institutionalism, in a sense that really emphasize is that there is no sort of one size fits all theory, right? That we need to contextualize all these different theories. And I think that is a very good, in a way, component to MMT. I do think that institutionalism is part of the MMT, or I should say the other way. I think MMT doesn't stand on the shoulder of many of these great institutionalists, right? To really understand, let's say, if, I mean, if countries wanted to adopt a sort of MMT informed policies, then they really need to look at their specific institutions in order to make sense of what is the sensible right policy to adopt. But I totally agree with you when it comes to developing countries because of their resources constraints and because they sit so low in the international currency hierarchy, they are in very many sense are constrained. Their monetary sovereignty right, is very much truncated. And MMT theorists definitely are aware of that. So we have, you know, Fadal has been really advocating how we can try to relax that resource constraints by achieving food and energy and technological sovereignty. And my own work has been looking at development finance, 
because there's always this argument that developing countries have to trade their commodities and their raw materials in order to get the exchanges, in order to purchase the necessary goods from the rest of the world. But two things, I think one thing is develop, development finance needs to be primarily domestic oriented. There are a lot of resources that developing countries can mobilize collectively or individually. And so we really need to think about finance needs to be domestic in the first resort. And the second is a lot of times we think that developing countries are exporting, are getting those precious foreign exchanges in order to buy the life supporting right food or energies. But the reality is far from, I mean, that's far from the truth. When you just look at very recently, I just read this report about Nigeria, for example, their debt management agency reported that 96.3% of the government revenues in 2022 were spent on debt servicing, okay? 96%. I mean, this is just mind-boggling, right? When you say, oh, countries have to get the reserves in order, I mean, get the foreign exchanges to get their essential goods. That is not the case, right? Many of the developed countries are exporting, getting the foreign reserves simply to repay their foreign debt. It has nothing to do with get their economy going, get their people's lives better. So I think that it's a very important issue to look into. And just in case anybody newer to this stuff is listening, when we say that exports are a material cost to a country and imports are a material benefit to the country that's importing them, we're not ascribing any moral value. We're not saying exports are therefore bad and imports are therefore good. There's no moral value. We're just saying the exports are what your country is paying, if you like, for what it imports, what it's sending to the rest of the world in return for what it's getting from the rest of the world. And that's something that trips a lot of people up, I think. Yeah, we're definitely not saying everybody should be an importer, right? Uh (laughs) (laughs) You can't have everybody be an exporter. You can't have everybody be an importer. It's just logically impossible, right? But what I find useful about it is that once you see it that way, so saying imports are a benefit and exports are a cost, is looking at it from the resource perspective. Absolutely. And it makes evident who's benefiting at the moment in the world and from what. And it, it just adds another layer of understanding of that, I think. So it's useful for that. I wouldn't say that we should be advocating for every country to become an importer. <laughs> so regarding the exchange rates, Jan, so through the MMT lens, the money story, it starts with the government needing to provision itself and it lays on a tax into something only it could create. We call those things pounds here in the UK. The government spends them into existence when it pays for things, either directly or through its agents. And because the government is the monopoly issuer of pounds in this country, the government determines what those pounds are going to be worth in terms of other things, other goods and services, when it chooses the price it pays for those goods and services, as Warren Bosler puts it, prices paid by government are the source of the price level. But how should we think about pricing in international trade? Is it a case of, as Warren has said in the past, well, so many Japanese TVs are going to exchange for so many tons of Australian coal, and what's going on with exchange rates doesn't really impact that. I know Warren would say something like the key thing is for a nation to optimize its real terms of trade, but I just wonder what your thoughts were on that. If you're thinking about international sort of terms of trade, then yes, I think it's, it is a sort of an extension, right, of what your domestic price level is and then that relative prices, right, on those various tradable goods and services. So in that sense, I mean, to some degree, I think Warren is right in pointing out because the government is for most of the countries, like a big employer, they pay directly the wages of the workers that they hire. And so that could set the anchor. Government also directly purchase a lot of goods and services. So that could be also the anchor. But, you know, I think there is still some room for, you know, some kinds of exchanges between the products the government directly purchase and the products that the government may not directly purchase, right? But there, I think, still maybe complicated ratios and processes that these ratios could be worked out. So I would say, on the one hand, when you really just think about in terms of the terms of trade between different countries, then that price ratio, the relative prices domestically and internationally or at the foreign country could to some degree shape that terms of trade. But when it comes to exchange rate, though, in terms of the relative value of your currencies, a lot of those are really determined by assets prices, right? It's not just the goods. 
the BIS, the Bank of International Settlements, always have their surveys of, uh, you know, how much we have in terms of the foreign exchange market transactions. And then compare that, if you look at trade, we could see really just a very small fraction of that foreign exchange transactions are to support trade, right? When I looked at 2019's data, about 1.5% of the global foreign exchange market activities, only 1.5% of that is really to facilitate trading goods and services. So just 1.5%. It's a very small fraction. So in other words, the exchange rates are to a much greater degree determined not by trading goods and services, but by these kinds of foreign exchange transactions. So purchasing different currencies, purchasing different currency denominated financial assets, be it bonds, stocks, or derivatives, right? So those are much more significant in determining the so-called supply and demand for certain foreign exchanges. And I think Mosler would definitely say, because the government determines the policy rate in the short term, that definitely, to a great extent, shapes the financial assets values in respective countries, and that in turn would then affect these countries' current currency exchange rates. But again, I think what Warren has been saying is that the government chooses to allow the market to play some role, right? So for example, the United States government in normal times, quote unquote, right? They don't necessarily control the yield curve where the Japanese government has just done it. So that really is a policy, I think, discretion. So if the government wants to do that, they could really, to a great extent, shape varieties of financial assets, right, across different time spectrum and risk spectrum that would leave very little sort of room for the market to determine the asset prices and therefore exchange rates. But that's not the world we lived in right now. I feel like I know very little about China, even though it's on the news a lot, because I don't know what I can trust about what is being said and what I can't. But to what extent does China look to the West for economics advice, or do they just simply do their own thing? They have their own kind of school of thought completely separate from ours. Well, this is a great question. I think there's a lot of misconceptions or just a lack of information about China. And I think that is manufactured, right? I think that in the West, a lot of narratives that are very negative and biased on China, but the Chinese media doesn't necessarily help to provide a very objective picture. And so it, it is a complicated country and it's a very complicated media landscape. And so it's difficult to know China, right? But in terms of China learning from the United States or other countries, I think that is very interesting. And that has been really evolving. I remember when I went to college in late 1990s, it's very interesting. We learn about, we have classes, right? There are the sort of required classes that are called Western economics. And that's basically the require course, and it's mostly Samuelson, principle of economics, micro, macro, the standard stuff. And then we turn around, there's another require course on political economy, and we study Marcion, right? It's very torn. <laughs> but these days, right, I think with 40 years of pretty remarkable growth, I think that really bolster China's policymakers' confidence. They felt that we have different models, right, that we do things differently than the West, so some of the examples is the China definitely does not agree with some of the multilateral banks like the IMF, right, to impose austerities or so-called fiscal consolidations in other countries, in the borrowing countries. And China has been opposing that for really good reasons, as we all know. So in that sense, I do think that China is not simply copying, so to speak, right, the Western sort of economic thoughts and so on. But at the same time, when you look at China's policymaking circle, they also debate a lot about MMT insights, right? So for example, they still believe that government could overspend, government should be constrained by some kinds of budgetary discipline. They also think that in some ways, the government or the central bank can control money supply, still to this day, right? They're still talking about how we should control to some degree, the M2 and so forth. That was going to be a question I was going to ask you is like in terms of monetary policy, is the central bank pretty much implementing what I'd call traditional monetary policy as the mainstream economists understand it? They lower rates when they want to stimulate and they raise rates when they want to cool it down. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you saw that the central bank just lowered 
the seven day repo rate and trying to stimulate the economy. So yes, absolutely. They are still in that kinds of uh, tradition, but they do have different policy tools and some of the nuanced differences and so on and so forth. But so go back to your question. I think, Patricia, it's a mixed picture. And I do think that China is still very open in terms of getting some of these Western economic thought. And there has been a rich sort of exchanges, right? So I just discovered recently, I've been reading some of the history of thought. And also, I think Isabella Weber has this wonderful book that really talked about how China in its transition in the late 70s, early 80s, has been getting some of these ideas from the Westerns. And they're doing it in a very interesting way in the sense that they're not just listening to one schools of thought, right? They welcome some of the Keynesian economics, but they also look at Austrians. They're also looking at monetarism. So I think today in China still, there are all these rich debates and vibrant debates. There are some welcoming receptions of Keynesian economics or monetarism for that matter. But then I think many of the Chinese scholars are really trying to see how to contextualize some of these Western thoughts and not to accept them in a wholesale basis, but they are not going to reject them altogether either. So some true pluralism going on in there, which is a positive thing. I think that would be a good way to label it. That pluralism still is not on an equal footing, right? So I would say still monetarism and neoclassical and all these are still taking a much more prominent role here to, I mean, just similar, right, in, in the States and, and elsewhere. Yeah. And so, as you just said, they're lowering some of their key rates over there, the central bank are in China. And on that topic, why would you say China's inflation rate is low compared to the US, the UK and Europe as you see it? China's inflation rate is very low, right? So it's 1%, 2%. It's mostly 1%-ish, right? And depending on you're looking at what kinds of indicators, if you're looking at core CPI or just general CPI or the equivalent to the consumer price sort of index. So I think China has a different sort of issue, right? Its issue is demand, is the demand insufficiency. Because of the COVID, China had a really draconian sort of lockdown policies for pretty much the past three years, right? It just reopened by the end of last year. So they had a different problem. They had really trying to maintain the same kind of supply chain supply system when they did the lockdown. So they have the closed loop factory production system. So even though there's a lockdown, a lot of the factory workers, they're in this closed loop situation. They basically live on their campus. They work, they go back to the dorms. They're very much in this sort of a closed loop and they're very heavily sort of monitored and make sure the production can continue with multiple shifts and so forth. So they have very, I wouldn't say little, but they have much less supply side disruption compared to the US and UK or other Western European countries. So the supply constraint is less prominent, but the demand constraint has been severe, right? People are locked down back home, cannot go out to spend their money and so on and so forth. So they have a different sort of challenge is the demand is too low, is too weak. On top of that, the export demand has been sliding because the Western economies are not doing well. So their export has been going down. Back in May, they have a negative growth in their exports. So in general, there's been a weak demand. And so they have deflationary pressure rather than inflationary pressure. And so that's what prompt the central bank to lower their repo rates and their policy rates and trying to provide more liquidity to, and credit to the market. But as we all know, right, from the MMT community, that monetary policy is very ineffective. If you lower the rates, it's not necessarily that's going to prompt the palm that people will simply start borrowing. And not to mention, I think China has been trying to deleverage. The private debt to GDP ratio has been going up. I mean, the total national debt to GDP ratio is over 289%. So the government has been trying to deleverage and trying to build up the private sector's balance sheets. So if you lower the interest rates, there is a question if there are going to be more borrowing. And if there is, right, then you start worried about the debt problem. So I think what really needs to happen, of course, is on the fiscal side, right? Definitely we want to have full employment policies because the youth unemployment rate has been so high, over 20%. And the local governments that have been really instrumental 
in supporting local businesses are now in really sort of cash strapped situation. So there could be a lot of room on the fiscal front to help to stimulate the economy. Obviously, it's a monetarily sovereign central government, but the local governments are heavily indebted. Is that right? And is that a concern? Absolutely. I think that is a big problem, is that mismatched spending capacity and their spending through responsibility. So the local government has only about 50% of the fiscal revenues, and they're responsible for over 80-85% of the local spending. And a lot of these are social spendings, right? So this is a significant problem. I think the Bloomberg has been always reporting all these hidden debt in the local government's level. And so on their balance sheets, their debt to GDP ratio is about 30-40%. But then if you add the hidden debt, that could be 50-60% of the GDP at the local government level. So I don't think this is really a sort of bankruptcy problem because I do believe the central government definitely has the will and also the means, right, to, to help the local governments. But what I really worry is the local government starts to tighten their belt, right, and reduce their social spending. And there has been evidence of that. The social spending at the local level has been going down over the years, especially in the past few years, when they're really losing a lot of fiscal revenues because of the COVID and then have to spend a lot, right, in supporting COVID lockdowns and so on and so forth. So that is the big problem. There has been Chinese scholars writing on this problem from an MMT perspective, and they published a paper in JPKE. And I'm right now writing a, not a paper exactly on the same topic, but provide some updates, but also looking at more of the sort of text side how to solve this sort of local government debt conundrum, how to go forward. So yes, I think that is the problem. It's not that the government is spending too much or having too much debt. It's really the central government is not doing enough, but the local government is inundated with debt. And that could have unpleasant right, or negative consequences. Is there scope for that to just flip around for the central government to realize that well, they are sovereign in their own currency and that maybe if it's for social spending purposes, I don't know how it would work on the ground. Maybe that they do buy municipal bonds or something to keep the muni prices up or something like that. Or, or do they just take the local government's debt onto their own balance sheet? Well, I think that's a great question. I think there are definitely different ways of doing that. And we have to differentiate the different kinds of spending at the local level. So to me, social spending, it makes sense. For example, the local education or pensions or healthcare, a lot of these should come from the local government because this is a very much tailored spending, right? Different areas have different realities and the local governments understand their institutional setups. And so they should be responsible for a lot of those spendings. But you do need some kind of central sort of coordination, right? You can have the rich areas spend a lot more on healthcare where the poor counties could not have the means to do that. I'm thinking centrally funded, locally administered. Sound familiar, right? Exactly. Right. That is exactly, I think, the right approach, right? The central government should take on some of the spending in terms of financing, but let the local government spend exactly how they want to spend. But then when it comes to, for example, infrastructure construction, then I do think that the central government needs to pay the bill a lot more than what it's doing now, right? And now in China, in Chinese, I thought many people are saying the central governments are ordered the dishes and the local government has to pay the bill. And so when you think about infrastructure, a lot of times it is not just limited to one province or one city or one county, right? Because if when you're building a mega project, it spans over several local jurisdictions. And so I think the central government should definitely take on more of the financing and of that. Now, there are definitely questions of how the central government does that. Does it do that through direct spending? Or does it do it through fiscal central transfer to the local governments? And there are definitely different approaches. So I would go into a little bit more sort of nuance in my paper. But I think just in general, as you said, right, is that the central government needs to take on more of the spending and provide more means of financing to the local government. So two prompts approach, I would say that's the way to go. And so how financialized is China's economy? Does the government have a favorable view of financialization? I mean, it's basically the only game in town if you're in the UK. You know, that's what we do here. Everything's geared up to make the city happy. But I just wondered what was the picture in China? 
Right. So I think in the developing world, again, the mainstream approach is financial deepening, right? That we need to expand and we need to develop the financial system because that facilitate development. But I think there has been a lot of emerging and some more actually well-established critiques where, you know, financial deepening or financialization, they have certain limits, right? That there are some sort of diminishing marginal return to continuing financial deepening, which is basically expand your financial sector. And depends on how you define financialization. I think it's not just the size of the financial sector, but also the increasing accumulation through financial channels and also the increasing sort of financial motives, right? Dominate over any other sort of motives of any economic activities, right? So it's all about maximizing shareholder values. It's all about increasing your stock performances at expense of any other sort of needs of the stakeholders of corporations and whatnot. So I think in China, the picture is somewhat mixed. The financial sector contributes to about 88% to China's GDP. I think in the US, that's pretty similar, right? Seven or 8% of the GDP is from the financial services. But, you know, in terms of the profits, the financial profits account for about only 13% of the total corporate profits in China. And so the United States is easily twice or three times of that share. So in that sense, China is not as financialized if you are thinking about how much accumulation comes from the financial sector. The other thing is when you think about corporate interest, for China, the non-finance corporations held about 30% of their total assets in financial assets. So when you look at how much assets they have, about 30% of them are financial assets. So that's by no means little, right? I think that is in a way comparable to the United States. So in that sense, a lot of these even non-financial corporations are taking on so much financial assets, right? And so that kind of divert them from their real sort of businesses, right? Just like in the US, we say GM is not making money from selling cars. They're making money from selling car loans. And then you compare, you know, banking size and you look at the stock market size in China. China has very sort of bank dominated financial system. Bank assets about three times GDP, but its capital market is much smaller compared to the United States. It's only half of in terms of stock market capitalization to GDP ratio, China is 65%. The US is 150%. So in that sense, if you're looking at the indicators, then one could argue China is not as financialized as the US. And one last, I think, interesting piece on this is that the Chinese policymakers are all the way up to the president, right? Xi Jinping. As early as 2016, he has emphasized in multiple occasions that finance must serve the real economy. Right. And he's made multiple also announcements that housing is to live in, it's not for speculation, right? So we could debate about how well these slogans, so to speak, are being implemented on the ground. But at least, I think, at the highest policy level, right, the director level, there is the sense that finance needs to be the servant of the real economy instead of the other way around. So I wanted to be optimistic. I think China is definitely you know, they have been cracking down the shadow banking system. And I have been doing quite a bit of work on that. My INET grant was to work on China's shadow banking system and how it could destabilize financial system and affect macroeconomy. But, you know, I think I'm happy to report that that shadow banking system has been very much suppressed in the past few years. But of course, the local government debt is still a big problem. That is still part of big shadow banking system, the way that local government tries to get funding is through the shadows institutions. So that is still a remaining, I think, problem. What do we mean by the shadow institutions? Shadow banking sounds a little bit different to what it actually is, as I understand it. I mean, there are different ways that are maybe less, I think, uh, parallel banking system and so on and so forth, right? So in the US, we know a lot of that is manifested in sort of securitization, right? That you're packing the loan and then you slice it off, you change it and you sell it. That's the US's main shadow banking, sort of the way it functions. In China, it's less securitized, but it does include a lot of off-balance sheet transactions. So you could have, for example, all these, the, the main things, for example, one is on the banking side, they sell a lot of things called the wealth management funds, basically is some of these wealth products that are not guaranteed, but because they're issued by banks, it 
provides appealing yield. And so a lot of the savers would purchase these wealth management products. And then the funds are raised through these wealth management products, then be invested, right, in all kinds of sectors, real estates or infrastructure or industries, many things like that. And they're not on the book of the loan portfolios of these various banks, right? So in that sense, it is a shadow. And that is very close to the securitized loans in the US, the counterpart. But on the other hand, there's also many different kinds of institutions like trusts, right? So a lot of these do one way or the other get their financing, get their loans from the banks, but then they sell their securities and use the fundings to invest in, again, areas where the government doesn't necessarily support and that those sectors don't necessarily get the funding from the formal banking system. And therefore, these trusts, these wealth management funds are able to invest in those areas. There's definitely, like what you said, the back of the alley, people to people funding and a lot of internet finance. All of these are kind of, as long as it's outside of the formal banking system and it's avoiding this kind of commercial banking regulations are in this category of shadow banks. And I mentioned the local governments. One of the major ways that the local governments trying to fill the coffer, given that they're so cash strapped, is either they lease the land or they set up this local government financing vehicle. So these are shell companies that get capitalized by the local governments through their land leasing revenues. And these financing vehicles then either issue bonds to raise funds or borrow from banks, right? So this is the part of the shadow institutions, because again, they behave like banks, right? They behave like banks, they get loans from banks and then lend to the various agencies in the local governments and so on and so forth, but they're not really being regulated like banks in a way, is basically it's outside of the formal banking sector, right? Uh, eventually, one way or the other, they are getting their sort of sources of funding eventually from banks. That's why when the shadow banking is in trouble, right, it could create problems for the formal banks as well, right? Because they are basically exposed to these shadow lendings. We'll be right back after this message from our sponsor. <laughs> Hey there, dear listener. Our sponsor for this episode of the MMT podcast is you, the listener, and we can't do it without you. And when I say it, I mean our aim to promote the best understanding that we can put together of how this thing called the economy actually works and how we can make it better. And we think a big part of that is knowing that better is possible and that many destructive policy choices are often sold to us by falsely equating the spending capacity of a government to that of a household. The way your government spends is nothing like the way a person or a household spends because currency issuing governments are the source of their own spending money. Unemployment, underemployment, underfunded public health services, poverty, and many other things that politicians and pundits sell to us as sad but necessary are actually never necessary. Our money system has been mischaracterized in the media and academia for decades. An electorate that knows how it works can truly change things for the better and literally save lives. So we hope you can find it in your heart to support us via patreon.com slash MMT podcast because it really helps keep the show going and we want to make it bigger and better. So thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive back in. When I was doing my master's, I remember almost half of our class of over 100 students were from China, actually. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it was amazing. And speaking to some of them, I asked them about whether they were studying, because the course had a really strong finance element to it, and whether they were studying economics and finance because they wanted to work in a UK bank or in, in a European bank, like a lot of other students did, or whether they wanted to apply to China and whether the finance sector was similar in China for them to be able to carry on their careers that way. And what they told me was that most of them wanted to return to China, but they just had a genuine curiosity for understanding how things were done over here. But also suppose that the credibility of the courses as well helps them in their careers. But they did say the finance sector in China it has some similarities, but is a lot more restricted in China than it is in the West. So what are the main restrictions 
that China imposes on its finance sector compared to here from your perspective? Right. I think there are two aspects of it. One is at the more sort of formal level, and then definitely it's on, you know, in terms of banking, lending, sort of restrictions and guidelines and things like that. But then also at the sort of personnel management, it's much more restrictive. So let me talk about the first one. So yes, in terms of bank lending, as you probably know, a lot of the commercial banks are the top four are state owned commercial banks. Right. So Bank of China, Construction Bank of China, Industrial and Commercial Bank of China. And I think I'm losing the last one. But the top four, the big four commercial banks are state owned. So they definitely are commercial banks. So they have their certain sort of criteria, right? So a project's bankable if there's enough profits and so on and so forth. That would to a great extent determine whether they're willing to lend and how much they are willing to lend and so on and so forth. But a lot of times, these banks are also implicitly or explicitly getting the guidance from either local governments or from their superior in the higher position to lend to, for example, state-owned enterprises or some strategic industries that the government wants to support. So there's definitely these kinds of policy lending directives where the banks would have to abide by. So I'm not sure if these Chinese students mean restrictive It's in the sense that there are sectors where they may want to lend, but, you know, the government would say, try to shy away from those sectors, right? But again, a lot of times I think these two are not completely separable, right? So for example, now the government said, we have a real estate problem, right? The real estate sector has been overheated and it's over constructed. So we now need to reduce some of the lendings going into the real estate sector, The banks may still feel like, oh, it's profitable for me, at least in the short term, to lend to them, but they would not want to do that in at least open way, right? They don't want to turn against the government's directives in continue to lend to the real estate. And also, on top of that, there are also the restrictions, for example, your load deposit ratios, but I'm not sure that is very different from the West, right, in terms of they do need to make sure that the balance sheet remains liquid and they need to make sure that they don't overlend and so forth. And then the second, I think, lag for that is the personal kind of level at personal management level. So in China, if a loan goes bad, directly the bank staff that is in charge of that loan would then take on sometimes personal responsibility, not in the sense they would be fined or they'll be asked to pay back the loans, but, you know, their career would be significantly negatively affected. So in that sense, I think they might feel the banking practice is more restrictive, that they have to be much more careful in exercise due diligence and so on and so forth. But then at the same time, need to balance the commercial profitability and the government's policy needs and whatnot. And the government in this instance acts as a social dimension to the whole finance. Right, absolutely. That's why I think I presented this China's development finance last time at the MMT summer school, and I did a similar one was a little bit updated this time again, which is I think these state-owned commercial banks or policy banks are really essential because they really allowed the state to mobilize that financing power, right? Financing resources to support real investment, right? Real investment. And that in turn drives economic growth and productivity growth. And so I think a lot of the sort of discussions or debates about why China has been able to grow so fast, I think a very much underappreciated aspect is how the states can harness, right, that sort of public money, that financing power to support investment, to support economic growth and transformation. No, no, no. Really, what you need over there is a gridlocked Congress. <laughs> I know. Yeah. yeah. That's what bond markets really love. <laughs> that's right. That's right. But I think in credit to where it's owned, I think with the sort of pressure of competing with China, right, that now we have been able to pass Infrastructure Act and Science and Job Act. And so all these, I think, are really helpful. I do think that we need a kind of industrial revitalization, but it's just so bad, like you said, we have this very dysfunctional political system that it always needs to set up a straw man or some kind of external threat, right, for those partisan sort of efforts to go forward. So the way I see it, China's a net exporter. As a consequence, it's built up huge savings in US dollars. And like anybody else being offered a risk-free return, they'd rather save in interest-bearing dollars than save in non-interest-bearing dollars. Those interest-bearing dollars are US government bonds. 
So China saving in US government bonds is often characterized as the government of China lending money to the US government, without which the US wouldn't be quite so rich and influential and able to be the global hegemon. And then at the same time, you've got many Americans who can be convinced to worry that this also means that the US is somehow in the pocket of China because it owes China all these dollars now. So I just wonder what your thoughts were on that whole framing, because there's a lot of confusion out there on this topic. Right, absolutely. I think that's why MMTers really need to gear up to debunk right all these myths. So we definitely understand that the U.S. government, they don't have to sell bonds, right? They're self-financing. They don't need to sell bonds. Um, they sell bonds for other reasons than trying to get the financing to support the domestic spending. So this idea that somehow China is the biggest creditor and somehow they can dump all these U.S. treasuries and that would kill the dollars and that would reduce the the sort of fiscal capacity for the U.S. government to spend, I think all these are nonsensical, right? And all these are debunked by the MMT community, where the U.S. government can always decide how much they wanted to spend and how they wanted to finance it, right? Is it through quote-unquote money creation or through selling bonds? And they also decide on the terms in which these treasuries are sold. So definitely, if China does not buy these treasuries, I'm 100% sure, right, that the U.S. government can find other buyers, right, for its treasuries. And if there's really no markets wants to buy the treasuries and rather wanted to take the dollars, which is non-interest bearing, then so be it, right? What is the problem? So I don't think that is really the problem. And again, going back to this idea that the exports are a net cost, a resources cost for those net exporters. I think China is definitely in that scenario. And China definitely worries about this large amount of foreign exchange reserves that are held in dollars or dollar assets, right? That China right now has about 3 trillion foreign exchange reserves and at least half of it, if not more, they're pretty opaque about it, right? So we don't necessarily know exactly where they invest their foreign exchange reserves. And there are all these arguments about shadow reserves and so forth that I'm not going to go into that right now. But but they do see the problem of having too much dollar in their foreign exchange reserves. And that becomes a problem for them, right? As you all have probably heard this phrase that you own the, the bank $100 and, you know, you are the problem, right? But if you're owing the bank $100 million, right, in this case, $3 trillion, right, then the bank has a problem. So I think for China as a creditor holding so much dollars in their pockets, it becomes a problem. If dollar, the value decreases and so forth, then China can suffer this kind of capital loss. And I think it's since 2009 that we have heard the Chinese central banker very explicitly and openly at the BIS conference advocating for an international reserve currency instead of having the dollar being this hegemon reserve currency. And they definitely talked about this from a risk management perspective, right? Because if there's financial crisis that was originated from the United States that really reduced the dollar value, then all of these dollar assets would, would suffer. And so China has made visible kind of attempt to diversify and move away from treasuries and other dollar denominated assets. Their holding of the US Treasury peaked in 2014, about 1.3 trillion. And now the latest, they are holding about $860 billion of treasuries, which is by no means a trivial amount. And so that means they're still trying to diversify. But it's very difficult to do so when you have that large amount of reserves and the fact the dollar still accounts for 58% of the total reserves around the world, right? Foreign exchange reserves around the world. It, it's like, what can you buy? Yeah. So so China, they actually wanted to buy things like US tech firms, right? Or any sort of real assets from the United States. But that was basically blocked, right? By the nation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because that's where I was going to contrast it with when the government of Norway builds up export revenues. Instead of saving it in dollars, it's chosen to diversify, invest. They have a portfolio of equities, otherwise known as a sovereign wealth fund. I believe the Chinese government has similar portfolios. Yes, they do. The China Investment Corporation, they set it up in 2007, and that's precisely the, the it's a sovereign investment funds that do go out and fund other kinds of banks and also directly invest in some of the projects. I think some MMTs get confused by sovereign wealth funds because I think the way it's 
pitch to us say in the uk is that we squandered our oil wealth our north sea oil wealth we didn't start a sovereign wealth fund back when we were selling a lot more oil whereas norway's done it right and mmts will say well look any domestic spending that we need to do we're monetarily sovereign we don't have to (laughs) you know what i mean it's not dependent on our exports And so why do nations have sovereign wealth funds? And I guess our answer to that is, well, you have no choice but to build up reserves of some kind that aren't your currency when you're a net exporter. Am I right? Yes, that is a great question. And that's exactly what I am hoping to spend a few more minutes on this, which is what is the logic of countries that, you know, knowing or not knowing that exports are real cost and why are they still trying to net exports and then just build up all these reserves and then mind you, reserves pay very little because they're mostly there for security and liquidity reasons. So in other words, a hardworking Chinese worker works so hard to export and we earn the dollars and now we turn around, invest the dollars into treasuries that earn very little. Why are we doing this? So you're right, Sovereign Wealth Fund in some ways can help to make those reserves more profitable or more efficient or efficiently used, however you wanted to put it, instead of just putting in the treasuries that pay so little, right? So it is helpful, but at the same time, it still doesn't really necessarily address the question of why countries are doing that. So the US would always say the Chinese are implementing this new mercantilism policy, right? That China wants to export because they want the dollars, because they want to create jobs at home and so forth. But I think one of the major reasons, and If you look around the world, if you look at the amount of foreign exchange reserves that have been accumulated, especially in the developing world, and you just analyze, right, just to think a little bit about why countries accumulate that much of reserves, right? When you look at the convention view is you you accumulate reserves that are enough to pay your three months worth of imports, or you accumulate reserves that are able to cover your one year short term debt, and your accumulated reserves that are equivalent to certain ratio of your M2. There are all these different reasons for why countries accumulate reserves. But by whatever measure that you look at, right, countries are accumulating way more reserves than what rational kind of policymakers would do, right? Why are you accumulating so much security? Why are you keeping so much your foreign reserves as a reserve instead of actively invested overseas and use it to import, right, to benefit your citizens and so on and so forth? What I would argue is this. We have a very dysfunctional international financial system, the Bretton Woods system, which creates all these financial instability, all these financial crises. And there's no actual sense of the lender of a last resort. And we have a system where the debtors, the deficit countries are responsible for making the adjustments. So this is a system where you have to seek self-protection. And the way countries do that is by accumulating reserves. When you look at China, for example, They really learned the lesson from the Asian financial crisis in the late 90s. And that's why once they join the WTO, once they're able to accumulate net exports, once they try to attract foreign investment, they start to accumulate foreign exchange reserves. So one could argue you could always create jobs domestically. You don't need to be a net exporter in order to create jobs. There's no no natural constraint for any countries to achieve full employment. You don't have to do this through better they neighbor kind of policies to export and to create jobs. You can create jobs domestically. So really what countries are doing right now is that the international financial system is failing them and therefore they would have to try to protect themselves by trying to be a net exporters and trying to accumulate foreign exchange reserves. Now, I know that sounds, some people would say that this doesn't give the developing countries any sort of agency in determining their own policies. But I would say they do have the agency, but they have to look at the international situations in order to decide what is the priority to stabilize the financial order and so on and so forth. So right now, there are a lot of debates about de-dollarization, how Chinese yuan may in some ways replace the dollar or at least dethrone the dollar's hegemonic status. But I think the real question is, do we simply want to replace one currency with the other? Or do we want to reform the system so that we don't have the need, right, the perceived need of financial instability and the need to accumulate reserves, and the need to adjust as a deficit or debt a country. Because now all this burden of adjustment is imposed on the deficit countries, the debt to countries. So I think that is the real problem. We have over half of these low-income countries are either in deep debt distress or at the brink of debt distress. And there's no 
really workable pathway right now. And I think that is the big problem that the system is really failing. And we need to change that. So a while back before the whole Ukraine war started, I remember quite a few articles going around about the danger to the US of the Chinese holding so many bonds. And a lot of it focused on what the Chinese could do with those bonds, right? The power that it gave the Chinese. It's funny. Everybody thinks they're losing in this equation as well. Yeah, they right? do. <laughs> <laughs> but they forget, I think, where those bonds are held. And if the war in Ukraine showed us anything, was that the US is very willing to use its authority to deny access to those bonds to anybody that it feels threatened by. So I think it froze Russia's reserves. And I was wondering, and I, you've already mentioned that China was already seen some risk in having everything and all the eggs in one basket, effectively, in, in dollars. And they were trying to diversify a bit. But to what extent has that been even a more pressing need following the war and seeing how the US has reacted to the Russia threat. And I feel like China often keeps its cards very close to its chest <laughs> just because it wants to do its own thing behind the scenes, prepare for any eventuality and then not upset the monster in a way until it absolutely has to. But do you think that war situation has made them realize something or was it something that they were already expecting? There's so much to unpack <laughs> in your statement. I mean, because the, there's really, I think, really great kind of context. I just maybe just a few points that you just mentioned. One is, yes, you're right. The U.S. definitely has the way, right, to block the kinds of any actions from China to quote unquote dumb the U.S. treasuries. They could freeze the Chinese foreign exchange reserves and so on and so forth, like the way they did to other countries, including Russia or Iran, for that matter. From the perspective of China, I think going back to this, again, this idea that when you are having so much treasuries or any sort of dollar-denominated assets, it's totally not in the interest of China to purposely, right, trying to crush the dollar value because they are going to be the one holding much of the loss, not the United States. So I think we need to look at from both sides that the U.S. has the capacity to stop that and China does not have the willingness to do that in the first place. So that's number one. And number two, I think, Patricia, you were talking about how China is not trying to offend unless it has to. And I think that in a way, it does speak to China's priority. Chinese or the Chinese leaders, right, at least in their opening statements, they really prioritize their own development from within. It's not that they are trying to really challenge the U.S.'s status and whatnot and completely like what the Washington likes to say, right, to change the rule of the order, right, the rule-based system and whatnot, whatnot. I mean, China def definitely wants to improve that system. But I don't see that China somehow really trying to have the sort of open sort of Cold War or open kind of confrontation with the United States. I mean, if anything, every occasion, the Chinese leaders are trying to say, let's seek coexistence, right? Peaceful coexistence. So I don't see the point that China is trying to offend even at the great expense of its own economy and its dollar reserves, so to speak. It's quite funny because here, obviously, you get a lot of stories or China is preparing as if China is in a constant state of preparing for war against the West. And then you see them do their own thing. And you're like, they're minding their own business. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of debates about China's increasing its military budgets, national defense budget. But you, when you look at the US, you know, over $800 billion, China is $200 billion. Yeah. <laughs> China's population is way more than the US. When you look at per capita, it's really nothing. The US is Military spending is the next 10 countries combined, right? And not to mention these overseas military outpost. The U.S. far over dominant than any countries in the world. China has one military base at Djibouti. The U.S. has what, 300, 400? I don't remember. I can't keep counting the numbers. But they would never use those for evil. Of course not, right? <laughs> not for yeah. li liberation purposes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so I definitely think this has been a process in the making in terms of trying to dilute, right, the sort of the reliance on the U.S. dollars in international trade finance, in investment as a vehicle currency, and also as foreign exchange reserves. And as I mentioned, it's starting way early, 2009, when the then central bank governor already said, we need to have an international reserve system. We can't just rely on the dollar if the U.S. creates a financial crisis, right, and the dollar is going down, then it's going to drag the entire world with it. So we need something else. And so that's why China is not only trying to diversify its foreign exchanges, but it has worked with many other countries like Brazil, like Argentina, 
to have the RMB as the trade invoice, right? They're uh, agreeing to pay for China's exports with the yuan instead of the dollar. And also China wants to strike the deal with Saudi Arabia to buy oil with yuan and settle some of the trade with yuan. So China's definitely trying to move away from that dollar dominant system. And China is also working on setting up the swap lines, right? The currency swaps with many countries in the world. So in the sense that if there's any dry up of dollar liquidities, then China and their significant trade or investment partners will be able to provide the liquidity from their swap lines. China is also developing the SIPs, right? The China Interbanking System, which is a small scale counterpart of the SWIFT system so that they're able to do their international banking clearing without having to resort to the U.S. dominant system. So there are all these efforts that I think China is working on and trying to be less reliant on the U.S. dollar. But I think, again, we need to take the global south, not just China, not just the BRICS countries. BRICS countries are doing a lot of some sort of the kinds of reforms of the, at least at the regional level, at this country group level, right, to reduce the reliance on the dollar. The NDB, the New Development Bank, which is a bank that is set up by the BRICS five countries, they are trying to increase their local currency lending to about 30% of their total loan portfolio. This is the, their new president, which it was the former president of Brazil, have openly made announcement that we need to avoid putting all our eggs in one basket. We need to increase the local currency lending instead of rely on the dollars, just in case if the dollar liquidity is cut off or if the dollar system is blocked or if dollar loses its value and whatnot. So there are many different risks that I think countries start to realize and they're trying to work around. So we've spoken about the risks of holding the currency and the benefits of exporting in terms of the financial side of things. But I mean, the exporting strategy in China was also done for other reasons. I mean, the the reason why China has grown so much is because of the growth of manufacturing over there. And a lot of that has to do with, I mean, correct me when I'm wrong, but they facilitated the exporting markets by subsidizing to some extent the foreign entities coming and investing and placing conditions on those investments that they saw long-term benefits from. And these seem like such a departure from the usual developing country approach of just fully protectionism and just curtail imports and just focus internally on your own developing, your own industries. China had a much more open approach to this. My worry is that their success in doing that, it's very difficult for two countries in the world to be China. I think there can only be one, (laughs) really. I was just wondering what you thought about that and whether you thought that was the best approach or whether some more of the traditional type of protectionism would have been useful as well. I think the whole sort of discussion or the whole theory, right, about open trade versus protectionism, I think it's in some ways, it's a false dichotomy. I think that if you look around the world, looking at the history, right? That's the famous Ha Jung Jong's book about kicking away the letters, which is these developed countries who are now the strong advocate of open trade or free trade, they were never a free trader when they were growing, when they were the developing countries. So I think a similar thing can be said about the current developing countries, which is they do need some kinds of protectionism, quote unquote, right? Like you said, subsidize your export production will provide the right kind of policy, the right of financing, the right of incentives, the right of in- infrastructure to support your export production. I think developing countries should totally do that. I don't see any reason for why they have to stick to the sort of free trade or liberal trade that are imposed on them by the Washington consensus. Because these countries, the developed countries, they didn't do that themselves at all, right? Now they're telling us to do the things that they did not do in the past. So I definitely think that between development first kind of priority versus maintaining that free trade or liberal order, I mean, developing countries should definitely choose the first, right? They should choose putting the development first and protectionism or free trade, quote unquote, whatnot, those only serve the purpose of their economic development. That's number one. And number two, to look at China's sort of old experience. And I think it's right. I don't think that the traditional sort of export like growth is really a good characterization of China. You need to put state <laughs> somewhere in that phrase of more like growth, right? I mean, 
I am working on a book to talk about really from MMT's perspective through MMT lens, looking at China's growth. I mean, when you think about 300 million or 400 million, the migrant workers from the rural areas to the urban sector and work in this export production sector. The first question you ask is, you know, why other countries cannot do that, right? I know that there is a population size issues, but also why we don't see all these urban ghettos and all these workers being unemployed and not being able to increase their productivity and so forth. I think the government definitely stands behind to provide the infrastructure to urbanize, right, to be able to create jobs for these workers and to provide the necessary social sort of infrastructure, right, for these urban workers to be able to work and live in the urban areas. And like you also mentioned, Patricia, that China does not just allow foreign investors to come in and do whatever they want, right? They are very carefully allow certain foreign investors to come in and allow them to be in certain forms, right? It's a joint venture or is a completely privately foreign owned and also in what sectors, right? So there's a lot of, I would say, state, I don't know what you want to call it. People call it state steering. There are people call state led. They're saying statecraft, but maybe all of those, right? But then the question becomes, now that China is at the point where it develops to a certain degree, right? It cannot continue to rely on external demand. It needs to develop its own internal markets and its own domestic demand. And I think that is precisely what China has been doing, right? Since the early, I would say, right around 2014, when the then premier Wen Jiabao has been talking about China's growth has been uncoordinated, unbalanced, and unsustainable. So there are all these efforts in trying now to develop more domestic demand-based economy. So we could, again, talk about where China is at this point and how it's able to do it or not. That's a huge other sort of debate. But just to your question, yes, I think that in some ways the external demand has been very helpful for China in the past 30, 40 years, but that is not really what China can continue to do in the future. But then also this point about free trade or liberal order and all of this, I think countries should always question and challenge that. The interesting thing is now is the United States rediscovered the industrial policy. I actually don't think they ever forget about it, right? They have all this military industrial complex that really helped to fill their industrial production and so forth. I mean, I don't think that industrial policy is ever at the back seat. It just depends on where that industrial policy is being implemented in what sector and benefit whom. I think that is the question that has been changing. But, you know, again, the U.S. subsidies on the agricultural production, the protection on the agriculture sectors, that never went away, right? So it, I think it's just the hypocritical when you accuse other countries in subsidizing their industrial production, and yet all these advanced countries, once they have the competitiveness in their industrial sector, they continue to protect their agriculture sector, and yet they're simply just you know, ignore that or just conceal that. Yes, that hypocrisy is not just limited to America as well, because when the Inflation Reduction Act was introduced at the beginning of the year, or it kicked off to my memory at the beginning of the year around Davos, we've got a lot of leaders in Europe and in the UK declaring the Inflation Reduction Act to be the opening salvos of a trade war. I just think, well, what's the problem here? Let's have a competition to create green jobs. Let's finally have a war where the people who lose still win. Right. Absolutely. I think when it comes to trying to make the planet more green, more sustainable, more climate resilient, you know, as many, as much subsidies as you can afford. I mean, that's always good to promote, right? The kinds of green industries and green technologies. I think the only thing is, again, when developed countries have all the monetary sovereignty, right, their fiscal power to do all of this, I think we should not forget that the developing countries cannot be left out because we share the same planet. And so I think that is really the thing, like when China now is dominating in new energy vehicle or solar panel production or wind turbines, I definitely think that China needs to share the technologies and help developing countries to build their own climate resilient sort of infrastructure. And I think to some degree, China was doing it in its Belt and Road initiative, especially in the recent years, even though the scale has been going down, China's Belt and Road initiatives in terms of overseas spending, it has gone down visibly since about 2016. And of course, the COVID worsened that even more. But at least I think China now is trying to help countries like South Africa, right? And trying to help them to build more reliable and green power 
utilities and help them to build their transportation and also their power generation. Those two are the biggest sectors of investment of China's overseas financing, actually, starting in 2018. I feel like China sharing technology with the developing world is probably the US's worst nightmare at this point. Right. I think that's totally true. And I think that at the same time, I think once the US realized China now is a big competitor in those developing world, they are trying to gear up, right? So they now have the Global Structure Partnership Initiative and Build Back Better Initiative and all of these. I think to some degree is really, they know if they're not up the game, they're going to be out of the game. So a healthy competition is actually really good. I think if anything, one could question about China's intentionality, one could question this and that. But I think at least if China make the US aware that they cannot continue to forget about the developing world, you know, I then that is a great success, right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So Yan, before we wrap up, I know you're a very busy person. Tell us what you've got coming up in terms of events or papers or anything else that you've got going on in the real world or online or in alternate dimensions even. <laughs> anything you've got going on. You mentioned you were working on a book. So I'm taking sabbatical in the fall. And so my husband, Eric, is also having a whole year sabbatical. So that is really just precious time for us to really be able to focus on our research so for me, I have the two, I think, maybe three commitments for conferences. So one is this summer workshop on MMT that's going to be in Poznan in Poland that I'm going to be part of. And then there is the MMT conference in Berlin right after the summer school. So I'm going to be participating in that as well. And then I think there is another Polish NGO, or they call it Regeneration Congress. It's basically, again, trying to look at alternative theories to challenge the mainstream thinking. And so I also agreed to be part of that. So those are mostly just three conferences that I'm going to in the fall. But before I go to Europe, I'm going to first make a trip to China, which I think I talked to Christian about it. I'm going to China next week, actually, July the 6th. So I'll be visiting some universities and trying to promote MMT or have kinds of the conversations with either MMT supporters or MMT opponents, right? So hopefully we could have some productive conversations about MMT in China or MMT theories and MMT in the developing world. So some of the very fascinating, I think, topics. So those are mostly in terms of conferences and workshops and I wanted to reserve most of my time working on my book project, which is through MMT Lens, looking at China's economic development. And I think I'm also trying to, if I may, <laughs> if I have the time, really write a little bit more about China's role in the global financial system in terms of, again, development finance, abroad and at home, because I think there are just so many misconceptions, some of which we discussed today, right? Like, oh, China's dumping the U.S. treasuries and the U.S. is going to go bankrupt and all of that stuff. I just, sometimes it's difficult to just completely focus on your project when there's so many other feeling, right, very pressing kind of conversations that you want to be part of. So yeah, it will be, I hope it will be a busy semester focusing on research. Well, I just hope you're taking some time for yourself in the middle of all of that, <laughs> just to look after yourself and recharge. Yes, I will definitely try to do that, right? Work-life balance. What is that? <laughs> is that you and the thing? <laughs> I've read about it, yeah. And before I forget to ask, the MMT event in China, is that something that people can register for online? Is that something that we can link to? I don't really know at this point. So these are mostly based on universities. So the one that I'm going to, at the two up that I'm going to, one is really the top university in China, it's the Zhenming University. And they definitely have the ears of the policymaking circle and think tanks. So that is a very important MMT, I would say, breeding ground in China. There are definitely professors who have been writing MMT books. They have been advocating MMT in the policymaking circle. They have these macroeconomic forum that they organized, that they invite policymakers and think tank high level advisors to be part of. So I think that would be a great opportunity. But one way or the other, I think there's some conference proceedings or if there's any conference papers that I could share, I would definitely 
get hold of those. Okay, well, we could talk for hours, but we're going to have to leave it there. We've been speaking to Professor Yan Liang. I'll link to where you can stay current with Yan and everything she's up to in the show notes for this episode. And to where you can find out more about the International European MMT Conference, which takes place in Berlin on the 9th and 10th of September. And as we said, that will feature Yan along with L. Randall Ray, Nathan Tankers, Dirk Entz, Stephen Hale, and Dongo Sambasilla, and many more. For our UK listeners, there's going to be an event in London on the 1st of September featuring MMT founder Warren Mosler. Tickets are on sale yet, but I'll link to where you can sign up to the GIMS mailing list for updates about that. And finally, for our Patreon subscribers, there's a link to a patron episode that we recorded recently with Dr. Sam Levy about economics in the movies, along with many other patron-only episodes, including edited audio highlights of the book launch of MMT Key Insights Leading Thinkers. Check out the show notes for all of the above. But for now, thanks so much for joining us today on the MMT podcast, Professor Yan Liang. Thank you again. I really appreciate the opportunity, Christian and Patricia. It's been a, such a pleasure to talk to you. And I just look forward to further conversations in the near future. That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month and get access to patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. You can also find me on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino. And you can email us at mmtpodcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you.